in Psalms 81. Here we go. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Now, when I read these verses, I uh, have a tendency of putting myself in the verse and seeing, as it says here, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. I used to be in the land of Egypt. I don't know how many more of you were in the land of Egypt. Some of you were born in Canaan. <laughs> it's wonderful. I wish I had been born in Canaan. <laughs> but I got rescued from the land of Canaan, really, truly. And I tell you what, since that time, and uh, whenever I manage to open my mouth um, to receive any, in any case, the Lord has blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. I, I don't know what to say. I don't have time to start enumerating from the time that I became a Seventh-day Adventist until this day, all the blessings that I've enjoyed of the Lord. But I can just tell you that if I take a walk and I want to talk to the Lord and I run, run out of things to talk to him about, I just start thinking in terms of how did he bless me from the day that I've given, given my heart to him. And it's amazing just amazing. I wish I could tell you all of that. In any case, all that he asks of us, of course, is that we would follow him. That's it. If you'll turn with me now, you can keep your finger in Psalms 81 because we're coming right back, but we're going to look at one verse, John 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. And it's just in conjunction of, with what I'm just saying. The blessings and what it is that God really uh, wants from us. John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is who he says he is. He is who he claims to be. And we can safely follow him, can't we? Yes, and the closer we follow him, the less likely we are to fail, the less likely we are to lose our way, the less likely we are to make fatal mistakes. Now, it's not like we will never make mistakes. We, everyone makes mistakes, but they're not gonna be fatal because Jesus is our God. Could we improve on his leading? I don't think so. God is leading us. And it's never happened to me that I'm able to point to a time where I knew better than God. And so um, it's safe to follow him. That's all I'm trying to say this morning. Now, some people, and it's part of nature, some people just like to have their way. As a matter of fact, I think we're born that way. Have you ever seen little children who like to have their way? <laughs> They're only this big. <laughs> and boy, they can throw a tantrum when they don't get their way. Well, this tantrum, becomes a little bit more sophisticated as we get older, but we still th throw tantrums when we don't get our way. We're back to Psalms one, uh, excuse me, 81, and we're looking at verse 11. This is after Jesus tells us that he's rescued us. And he says, just open, open your arms, open your mouth. I'll just bless you and bless you and bless you. And I wish we all be believe it. But if you look at verse 11, it starts with the word but also. My people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. That's what it says there. So what did God have to do? Well, verse 12, it tells us what God has to do when people want to have their own way. He lets us have our own way. It's very simple. There's a quotation, Faith and Works, page... Forget it. Space and works, anyways, that says, when God allows a man to have his own way, it is the darkest hour of his life. This is what is called the wrath of God, actually. Well, verse 12, it says here, you know, in verse 11 says they wanted their own way. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lusts, and they walked in their own counsel. Uh, Isaiah 53, I put my Bible down. Isaiah 53, we're looking at verse 6. Isaiah 53, looking at verse 6. 
I could recite it. I don't know why I'm turning there, but Isaiah 53, verse 6. This is the great chapter which describes the suffering of Christ. It says in verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. We love to have our own way, but the tendency is to go astray. Proverbs 14, verse 12, There is a way that seems right to us, but the end is what? It's the way of death. Sure. And in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah says, It is not in man that walketh to direct his own path. So, Proverbs says, Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Anything outside of that is just pure insanity. And I've often said that we're all at certain degrees of, of insanity because we are all deceived, self-deceived, and our hearts are desperately wicked. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it says that, and so it is true. But the closer we come to Jesus, the less insane we are. <laughs> I'd like to wish that we were all not insane at all, but there's only one way not to be insane, and that's to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Because God sees what we cannot see. God knows the future, a future that we don't know anything about. And of course, he knows the outcome of all our decisions. And it's a lot easier if we would just get it in our heads that we can walk by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that'll be the safest way possible. Now, I know that I'm speaking to Seventh-day Adventists. I know that you are already sold on all of this. I'm just reminding you. Don't be insisting on having your own way. Have you ever met strong-minded people who just must have their own way? <laughs> no? <laughs> You've never met them? <laughs> well, let me tell you, there are some like that. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is very dangerous for people that want to have their own way because our, our way is not that clear. That's why we're studying this business called guidance, right? We need guidance from God. And if we don't have guidance from God, then we're going to go our way. Well, there is a way that seems right, but boy, I tell you what, it doesn't go where we want it to go. In the end, it does not end well. So don't be too hard-headed about what you want. There can be more than one way to skin a cat. Don't go around skinning cats either. So anyway, yeah, we want happiness. We want success, we want fulfillment, we want health, we want whatever it is the Lord is willing to give it to us if we will follow him. This morning, I just turned my, my, my telephone and to the news, just looked at the headlines, and there was one headline talking about Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, uh, who knows, who doesn't know who Elvis Presley is? Michelle doesn't know who Elvis Presley is. <laughs> Good for you, Michelle. Stay right there. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> yeah. Elvis Presley died 43 years ago, August 7, 1977. And, and he died at 42 of a heart attack. And the person who wrote this article, and I didn't bother to read, the, I just read a few words in the article, was saying she was his nurse. And she, she ministered to him for years and years and years. She says the last years of his life were so miserable. He was so unhappy. He was so lonely. And, and he was so uh, addicted to drugs and gaining weight until he looked like what he didn't want to look like. And, and then you, you think of Elvis Presley, who was amazingly rich, right? Amazingly talented, amazingly good looking. He could have anything he wanted in this world if he, if he had a mind to. He could have whatever he wanted. And what happened to him? He died of misery is really what it is. He had a heart attack. Uh, but it was because of all the drugs he was taking. And he was taking all the drugs because he was so lonely. And he was so lonely because money doesn't give you what you want. Yeah. Our minds have a way of playing tricks on us. And like we've studied before together, what advantages or disadvantages us is not a safe guide. Don't go after the thing that you think will give you an advantage or a disadvantage. The question is, what does God want from me? That's the only question. What does God want 
me to do? Where does God want me to work? And, and if we can solve that mystery, and it's not the end of the world, as a matter of fact, this is lesson number 11, we should by now have enough instructions to know how to find God's will for ourselves, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is asking us to be honest with ourselves. Several years ago, I was at Eden Valley, uh, as you know, I was here for 12 years before I went away to um, College Dale, Tennessee for five years. When I was uh, sometime in the past there, I had decided that I would transition from Eden Valley to Africa. Now, as far as I could tell, all my motives were right. A man should be living with his wife, and there were plenty of people who told me <laughs> that I should be living with my wife. Uh, there was this, this family camp we used to have here, and I've forgotten their names, but Restoration, Restoration International. And the guy who runs it and his wife, every time I would see him, I had to listen to a lecture as to, as to the fact that I was doing something wrong because my wife was in Africa and I was here. And either she should come here or I should go there. But it was wrong that we were separated. Well, it surely was not convenient, uh, but we thought the Lord wanted us to, to start another ministry in Africa, and we did. Um, but, you know, when I began thinking in terms of, yeah, maybe it's time for me to move on, then I began to think, well, it would be a good idea. If I went to Africa, I could help my wife, I could do the I could do the grunt work, whatever it would be, and it, perhaps it was time for a change at Eden Valley at the same time. And also, I had been studying, and everyone knows it's better to be decisive than to be wishy-washy, so I made a decision, and I intend, intended to stick to it. Now, was there anything wrong with my thinking? Well, the truth of the matter is, I don't know that there was anything wrong with my thinking, but I found myself in a different, in another dilemma. In volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 184, paragraph 2, and paragraph 4, we should fear to leave our appointed work unless the Lord clearly indicates our duty to serve him in another field. <laughs> so that brings in another dimension, right? Yeah, I, you know, I can think it's better that I, my wife and I could work together. I, I could have all kinds of reasons why I, it was time for me to leave. But did I have clear evidence that God wanted me to leave? Was it just something that was happening in my heart? Ellen White, this is, now this is paragraph four. Uh, many are eagerly turning from present duties and opportunities to some wider field. Many imagine that in some other position they would find it less difficult. You know, it's, it's never less difficult. Do you know why? Because there's a God in heaven and he is training us for heaven. And so the training doesn't stop because you move from here to go there. The training must go on, right? And if it was hard here, why should it be easier there? You think you've learned everything you're supposed to learn? Then probably not. And so we have all kinds of strange reasonings in our heads. If I could just be doing that, it would be easier than what I'm doing now. But it isn't so. God is training us, and we just need to come to grips with this thing. Yeah. Anyway, I made a decision according to the information I thought I had. But did I have clear guidance from heaven? So you can see how how intricate uh, finding your exact white spot is. You know, the Lord is trying to lead us and it's not always that easy because our own hearts will play tricks on us. Yeah, okay. Uh, volume three of the Testimonies, one, uh, this is um, page 13, paragraph one. I was shown that when the Lord released him, this is Ellen White speaking about James White, her husband. I was shown that when the Lord released him from his position, he would give him just as clear evidence of his release as he gave him when he laid the burden of the work upon him. So, then what? Where do I go from there? In Proverbs 11, verse 14. Proverbs 11, verse 14. Something I think that we're pretty well aware of. I don't know how well we... Um, advantage ourselves of this principle. Proverbs 11, verse 14. 
Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So when you want to know something, do you seek counsel? I'm pretty well notorious. It's amazing. When I first became a leader in self-supporting work, Warren Wilson used to say, there's one man among all the leaders in self-supporting work that never seeks counsel. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> really independent. Didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing well <laughs> in my own mind, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and then there are other people. I've seen many, many leaders that don't make a move unless they, they get counsel. They, they investigate as far as they can, and they do far better, I think. Testimonies to Ministers 497, paragraph 1. Among God's people are some who have had long experience in this work. These men should be regarded as tried and chosen counselors. They should be respected, and their judgments should be honored by those who are younger or who have had less experience, even though these younger men may be in official position. So that happens also. Some younger people get the position, but that doesn't give them all the experience just because they have the position. Now, this is true, of course, but it isn't the only word um, when it comes to Finding good counsel is not that easy. It isn't that easy. We tend to look for counsel from people who agree with us. Mm -hmm. Well, it's easy. And we kind of know who agrees with us. <laughs> and we kind of know who doesn't agree with us. And so when we seek for counsel, we go to people who agree with us. And then we get, uh, as a matter of fact, this happened to me um, yes, the day before yesterday. Um, uh, sitting on an executive committee with another institution. They're safe, facing huge problems. And uh, the individual who's the leader called for this meeting because she didn't want to make the decisions herself. She wanted help to make the decisions. So if the, if the executive committee made the decision, then it was their problem if it went south or anything like that. But the only problem was all the time that we had the meeting, she fought like mad to have her way. <laughs> Asking for permission, wanting the executive committee to make that decision so that we could take the, the heat if it didn't go well, but we couldn't talk any sense into her. <laughs> Not that we were trying that. We are just trying to figure out what the best thing to do. But what, what struck me was that she, she had in her mind what she wanted, you see. And it didn't, um, it, anyway, it ended up, we didn't make a decision. While I was off this executive committee, I called a couple of other people to counsel with them to see what they th thought. And then in the end, I came back to her, contrary to where she wanted to go, and said, here's what you need to do. <laughs> and her, her thing is like, I'll, I'll do it for this, but when it comes to that, we'll see. <laughs> I'm like, well, <laughs> what are you going to do? We gave you counsel. We'll see what happens. You know, when I'm stuck to give counsel, I, 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 I give the counsel I think I know it to be correct. But in the end, they're going to do what they're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to suffer or they're going to be right. Who knows sometimes. Go with me to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, we have, a, um, we have an illustration of this, which is an amazing illustration. The poor guy, this is Rehoboam here. Second Chronicles chapter 10. Rehoboam has just been made king of Judah and all of Israel, all of Israel, you know, the, the whole 12 tribes, he's made king. And he didn't last but a week, I think. And he, it was not a problem. It's just that he wouldn't take the right counsel. He wanted the counsel that he wanted. And so he asked counsel from the elders. Then he asked counsels from young people his own age. And he preferred the counsel from the young people his own age. And it didn't turn out so well. So we're going to read that. This is Second Chronicles chapter 10, look, starting with verse 6. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? The people said to him, Listen, reduce the taxes already, and we will serve you. Uh, it's just, you're just, the oppression is too much, and we can't live under this system. 
And so he went for counsel with the old men. And uh, verse 7, the old men spake to him, saying, If thou be kind to this people and please them, speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. And this would have been his, his uh, reign, right? But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, took counsel of the young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people which have spoken unto me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that your father did put upon us. The young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou if somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more of your, to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, and I will chastise you with scorpions. That, that's, this is really what was in his heart. This is what he wanted to do. He had counsel from two entities, and he chose the counsel that harmonized with what he wanted to do. And, of course, you, you can do what you want. It's just that the consequences are also, verse 18 and 19, you'll see what they are. Uh, verse 18 and 19 then King Rehoboam sent Hadoram that was over the tribute, and the children of Israel stoned him with stones, that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot and to flee, to run away from Jerusalem. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto that day. So there you go. That's how it turned out. When you go for counsel, don't go for counsel to people who agree with you. Not that that's necessarily wrong in and of itself. But go find counsel from people who are godly. That's, that's usually the thing that you want. Find the godliest people. Whether they agree with you or don't agree with you, they've got a, a reason for thinking the way they're thinking. And go there as much as you can. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 24 and 25. Jesus did not commit himself unto them, people, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And so he understands that our hearts are de deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and so he is not going to lean there, right? Um, I don't know that Jesus needed counsel from men at all. Now, we're in a different situation. We need counsel. The multitude of counselors, there's safety. If the multitude of counselors are godly, there is safety. In heavenly places, 132, paragraph 2. We are never safe while we are guided by human opinions. But we are safe when we are guided by a thus saith the Lord. Now, this isn't saying we don't need human counseling, but we sure, we sure want to do the best we can in finding the most godly counselors. 1st Thessalonians, 1st Thessalonians, we're looking at uh, chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13, in 1st Thessalonians. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it was in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believes. And so the word of God is effectual. You live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the blessing will come. For in conclusion, Great Controversy, page 598, paragraph 2. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves, as we are to answer for ourselves before God. That's a big principle that I try to emphasize with the lifestyle guests. I speak with them for half an hour every morning. And um, we come to one study that talks about being decisive, making decisions, and helping people to make decisions for themselves. 
because other people would be very happy to make decisions for you. There are people who are total controllers. <laughs> They'll be glad to control your life if, they, if you can be useful to them. And so be careful, read the scriptures, make decisions for yourself. Counsel with people who have experience and who are godly, as godly as you can find. And may the Lord guide you all. Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for being willing to instruct us and teach us in the way we should go. You've promised to do it. If we acknowledged you in all our ways, we would be led by you in all our ways. This is what we want, whatever it is. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's something we don't want to do, Heavenly Father. But help us to get past that negativity and to, and to put away our insanity and follow you. And we thank you as you bless the lifestyle guests, the students, the staff here, and, and the clients as they come by our, our, our stand and our store. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.